you want to support the show and get the episodes early and ad-free, head on over to freemanbeyondthewall.com forward slash support. There's a few ways you can support me there. One, there's a direct link to my website. Two, there's Subscribestar. Three, there's Patreon. Four, there's Substack. And now I've introduced Gumroad because I know that a lot of our guys are on Gumroad and they are against censorship. So if you head over to Gumroad and you subscribe through there, you'll get the episodes early and ad-free and you'll get an invite into the Telegram group. So I really appreciate all of the support everyone's giving me, and I hope to expand the show even more than it already has. Thank you so much. I want to welcome everyone back to the Pequeñones show. I'm here with Peter. Is it Siri? I don't remember how we how you pronounced it at the uh, at the event. Yeah, Siri is fine. Is that is that how it's pronounced, or how is it pronounced? Because people pronounce that, that's that's how we pronounce it. It's not the okay. correct pronunciation, but that's how we say it. My family. <laughs> What's funny is I pronounce my name differently. I have two brothers, and both of them pronounce our our last name differently than I do. So it, it's interesting. So um, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Well, abbreviated life story. I grew up in Connecticut and uh, led a pretty uneventful childhood. Uh, around when I was maybe 21, I decided I wanted to do crazy things. And uh, that involved in me moving to South America a few years later and um, starting a, basically having a permaculture homestead down there and organizing various group land buys uh, in Ecuador. Um, and I was, um, I was a libertarian back then, so I didn't really know anything. Uh, and over the years, I slowly realized that I had to come back to the United States, which is the best country in the world, and uh, realized that actually there's a there's a lot of demand here for people, like-minded people living together. There's a lot of cheap land in certain parts of the country. And it, it all came together perfectly. And now now I'm in Arkansas organizing group land buys here. A b- very, very abbreviated life story. There's a lot more I could have thrown in there. Yeah, well, one of the reasons why I would interested in having you on is because w- something I've talked about is localism. Um, I got out of the city. I was living in Atlanta for a lot of years and I ended up in a, in a very small town in Alabama. And I just thought that politically and culturally, um, it's better for, um, you know, there's a lot more that you can accomplish. There's a lot that you can avoid. And, um, you know, when I heard about what you guys, what you were doing, uh, I was very interested. Um, my wife was at the conference. She was very impressed with what you were doing as well. Um, why don't you talk about this? So a lot of people hear about, um, you know, hey, we're going to start a, we're all going to buy a bunch of land together and then we'll parcel it off and we'll build our own houses on it. Uh, what makes what you're doing different than that? Um, well, it, what's the main thing that's different is that you uh, legally have control over um, the group as a whole has control over who is able to live there and who can buy in and can also kick people out by nature of how um, the legal thing is organized. Now, what you what you mentioned, uh, a bunch of people buying a big parcel of land together and parceling it out. Um, there's a lot of ways that it, that can be done. There's a lot of ways that it can fail. And it usually things like that never even get off the ground because people don't also don't realize how much money it costs to actually parcel up a piece of land uh, or sometimes zoning prohibit it, prohibits it or the town council arbitrarily prohibits it. Um, and so some people will just buy a big piece of land and put like eight or 10 names on the title. Um, and so you're all co-owners of the land and then maybe agree upon how to parcel it up. But then uh, you still don't really have any control. Uh, each person has inalienable property rights and can sell it to whoever they want. Um, so, you know, you could have the kind of neighbors that you really don't want uh, to be influencing your kids very quickly. Um, so we, we basically have a framework that that not only allows people to buy land together in kind of like a private neighborhood uh, framework, um, but also means the group has control over who is in your neighborhood. Uh, you don't have to let just anybody in. Well, ha- Exactly how is that structured? I remember that you um, you used a term that I, I, I'm completely blanking on now. 
that was that was foreign to me when it came to local politics or or when it comes to localism and everything. What was the what was the term you used? Um, not the not talking about the LLC, but how you structure it as uh, where that you can have that freedom of association. Uh, I was probably talking about the PMA. Um, I, by the way, I, for some reason, your audio does cut out occasionally. I'm not sure if that's, that's probably my fault, but I, I'm pretty good at pretending I know what you're saying. So I, I think you were asking about the PMA, uh, which is yes. the term I, I, was asking, I used a lot. And I was and asking about the PMA. Yeah. And that's an important part of it. Uh, the PMA is nothing special. It's a private membership association. It doesn't have to be a legally registered organization. In fact, many private membership associations aren't. Um, you, you've all heard of things like the Lions Club, uh, the Rotary Club, and, and different groups like that. There's also like the Liberty Dollar Association. Many of those have incorporated entities, but then they also have what's called just a PMA or a private membership association, which is just a group of people who sign a document all agreeing to form this group and, and be a part of it. And that's an important part of what we're doing. It's not all of it, though. Um, to briefly describe what we're doing, um, is basically you have uh, two organizations. You have an LLC and you have a PMA. LLC is, of course, a limited liability corporation. Everyone asks, well, why don't we use a trust or a partnership or this or that? If you com if you compare all of those, uh, the LLC just comes out on top in terms of what we're trying to do, both for uh, liability, asset protection, and cost, you know, and all that. So basically, you have, um, in, in, you know, to oversimplify it all, you have an LLC that owns a piece of land, right? The people that want to live on that piece of land are all shareholders um, in the LLC. It's actually their members in the LLC. Um, so they own the LLC and the LLC owns the, the big piece of land. And the LLC will have a board of managers, usually from the group of members that, that manage uh, the whole project on behalf of the members, uh, making sure the land is parceled out right and everything. Um, and there's a LLC operating agreement, which is like the constitution or bylaws of the LLC. And that's, you know, ours is like 22 pages long and it details everything about the project and how the land is indefinitely allotted to each member. If everything were to fail and the LLC were to be dissolved, the land would, the same pieces of land would simply be titled to each member. Uh, so there's all kinds of fail safes in there. And the PMA is what's on top of that. And um, it's, it, it functions as a filter. It functions as a private club. Um, if you are like... As a lot of people know, like um, covenants in HOA agreements that like restrict who can move to the neighborhood or like say people with only certain political beliefs can can move into the neighborhood or something like that. It's, it's highly illegal, uh, according to the Fair Housing Act. But if there's no buying and selling of, of land involved and everything, the LLC doesn't do uh, business with the general public um, and you're all doing it on behalf of, of a private club, which is the PMA. Um, it's perfectly fine to do that. And so the PMA is basically a large organization. It's not just the people that are in that specific LLC that owns the land. Um, it, you know, you could have a PMA that has 300 people, and then you could have four different LLCs, each that have 10 or 20 members, and each one that owns its own piece of land. And the PMA is basically the talent pool. If you want to buy into one of these neighborhoods and build your house there and move your family in, you first you have to join the PMA. Now you're a member of the private clubs. Now the LLCs can, can deal with you, basically. Um, and that's basically, yeah, I could explain a lot more and I'm sure you, you can ask questions parts you want to understand better, but that's the, the general idea of it. Have you met any locally where you are, have you run into any problems of people accusing you of, of course, like wanting to keep out black people, wanting to keep out anybody? Um, no, it, no, we, we haven't. This is, I mean, all of our neighbors are very friendly and nice to us. Uh, nobody even really sees what we're doing that way. And we're living in an area that's um, demographically um, almost entirely white anyway. So it's not like, you know what I mean? No one's going to bat an eyelid. A bunch of white people move into a neighborhood that's already 100% white. You know what I mean? Like, no, uh, they don't even see it that way. Well, before we, before I try to come up with any other questions about the structure of everything, um, what's the purpose of this? Um, one thing that I get a lot of when I, you know, tell people that intentional communities as such, you know, private membership association as such is the way to go because, I mean, the regime in charge hates us, hates, hates anybody who thinks like us, hates white people, hates. So 
what do you, what do you say when people tell you that cuz i get this all the time the powers in the cities you're just running away you're a coward um you know you need to stay and fight for the cities because that's where the political power is that's where the fight is um i, I mean i think uh doing something like this is not for everybody i would say if you love living in a city being surrounded by people who hate you uh and and politicians that constantly make laws making the city life worse and worse and constantly raising the taxes and driving up business uh it's you're running up the the down escalator and if you love that kind of life and you want to keep doing that fine you know i'm not i'm not going to try to argue with anybody who's set on living in a city for the rest of their life that they should continue to do so um, so this isn't a solution that's necessary for everybody, but let me tell you, there are a heck of a lot of people that are more than happy to leave the city or even to leave the suburbs, uh, or just leave anywhere. Even we've had people even leave their rural area and come to our rural area, uh, just because in their rural area, um, their neighbors are all, you know, boomer q uh, who, you know, fly, uh, Israeli flags and the public schools are still doing questionable things to their kids, even in, even in many rural areas. Uh, so it's not so much, I know those people will like to accuse us of rural escapism or the idea that, um, it says connection lost. Can you hear me? I can hear you. So yeah, those people will accuse us of, um, rural escapism, uh, which is the idea that, uh, everyone should just escape to a rural area and like live off the land. This really hard, uh, um, grinding existence to escape the system. And that's not really what we're about. Um, we're more than happy to make nice suburban neighborhoods under this system once we get, you know, the funding and the people interested for that. It's more about wherever you are, whether whether you're in New York City or Chicago or some suburb in whatever state, uh, there's probably some serious issues going around where you are, and you may or may not be able to, to solve those problems, especially if you're in a blue state. The cards are stacked against you. Why stay and fight, you know? If you're, like, in a suburb around Chicago, for example, why, why stay and fight? If you want to, more power to you, but don't make fun of us. You know, those of us who actually realize we just want to live around people who think like us and act like us and aren't going to try to corrupt our chi and um, you know corrupt our children. Then you know, I, I think we're doing the right thing. You know. Well, I think a lot of the people who end up leveling this uh, accusation are they're neither married nor have kids and. Uh, you know, they feel like they can stay there and they can fight. And every once in a while, they'll have a uh, a conference that they'll put on in the city that'll get canceled eventually because, you know, that it, because it's the city and they don't agree with you. And then you get to play the martyr and you do things like that. I, I, I really don't know. I, I just assume if, if there are people who have kids, I understand saying, look, my job's here. I can't go. I have tons of family here. That makes sense. But um, the the idea that living around like my of like minded people who share your values that you wouldn't want to do that at some point in your life it just makes no sense to me. It's like it, it's. If you don't support at least what you're doing, what I've done, what you know, what a lot of what a lot of people have done, then I think you just. I don't think people are serious. They're just not taking it seriously. They're just there to to complain and not really find practical solutions to make their lives better. Yeah, and, and sometimes there are, some people are very focused on having to justify the things they do in their lives uh, by making everyone else seem wrong. And it's like, you don't really need to. Like, I have no resentment towards people who feel due to family connections or due to their really high paying job that their wife would pretty much divorce them if they quit that job, you know, and made a tenth as much somewhere else. Like, I understand I have no ill will towards people that are in those situations or even people that are just comfortable where they are or, or really want to stay and fight. Maybe someone's really involved in local politics. And even though the deck is totally stacked against them, maybe they want to stay and fight. That's fine. You know, like no problem with that. I just think that there's a lot of people that are going to want some other alternative. And life is a heck of a lot easier when all the people that are right next to you, right around you, all your neighbors are really think and act just like you politically, socially. Um, you don't, you know what I mean? It's you actually want to know your neighbors. Whereas nowadays, I think most Americans uh, don't talk to their neighbors, don't really know their neighbors, don't hang out with their neighbors. Uh, and especially when there's political divides between them, 
or traditional families that you can't even, I've heard all kinds of stories. They can't even let their kids hang out with uh, the kids of, of other people because they don't even know what they're teaching them. And those kids will start to teach their kids really weird things. Uh, it, it propagates like that. It's, it's hard to get away from. Let me ask you this. You mentioned in the beginning that you had uh, gone to South America originally. Um, what was the purpose of that? Um, well, a long time ago. Well, first of all, I was very different back then. I had different interests. I was very different politically. Um, and also one of my goals was to buy cheap land and, yeah, to start a community. Um, and I was also very, at the time, I was very interested in growing tropical fruits uh, and so, yeah, that led me to Florida. Then I realized that things were too expensive in Florida. And I had a, already had a friend down in, in South America who was looking for land. So I went down there and, and the rest was history. Um, and then as I kind of grew up over the next, you know, eight, nine years, um, I, that, that pulled me back to the United States. But my original reason for going down there was uh, buying cheap land, uh, starting community and growing uh tropical fruits, having a permaculture homestead where you can grow food, food, uh, year round. That was basically it. Was it that even back then you saw the writing on the wall and you thought that getting away from what was growing here was, uh, you know, was something you wanted to do? Yeah, there was a lot of that as well. I, I, you know, I wasn't politically anything like I am today, but I, I still definitely saw you know, like, you know, back then I was all like Ron Paul and stuff like that, you know, and like I could definitely see that things were not moving in a good direction. And of course, since then, they have not moved in a good direction. So <laughs> I was right. And um, I was I was just like, oh, this whole society is sick. Um, people are um, people are people are weird. You know, they're, they're not focused on the right things. And so I figured, well, if I start a community around me of like minded people, it would be much nicer. But, you know, it, what ended up happening is like a community of degenerate hippies around me, which um, as I grew up, I appreciated less and less, you know. They're very attracted to libertarian ideas, aren't they? Yeah, and, and uh, a lot of people assume that when I was down there, most of the people that came down to visit us were like liberals because they were hippies. But actually, no, the majority of the people that, that were at the communities down there were either conservative libertarian or apolitical like the ones that were political the majority of them with very few exceptions uh were um were yeah somewhat libertarian or anarchist anarcho-capitalist and uh it's interesting because yeah so few liberals i think uh, a lot of liberals are really like metropolitans you know like city boys they really don't like to leave the city and when they do travel to other country they're always just traveling from city to city to city they don't really like the farm life that much so that's probably why when we actually uh got people that were political they were usually heavily uh, or somewhat libertarian conservative and cap something like that despite being hippies they still you know they had those uh, those political ideas right right uh what do you think of um things like the free state project in new hampshire um it's a good initiative uh i just don't know whether it's been that effective um i i've I don't know enough specifics about New Hampshire to really be able to judge it. I just know that, that few people really see New Hampshire as a libertarian paradise. The other thing about libertarianism in general, if you are trying to create a libertarian paradise, sure, maybe you can turn a blue state red and get a lot of libertarians to move there. But what are libertarians really? Libertarians are uh, fiscally conservative and socially liberal in general, right? So they support a whole lot of things or are okay with a whole lot of things. Um, that really, you know, true conservatives really don't like. And are, so that, you know, as I got older, I realized, well, the fiscal conservative part of it is almost irrelevant. The social stuff is a lot more important. So if libertarians are wanting to, like the old meme says, uh, you know, allow, you know, their most important thing is uh, making sure that uh, gay married couples have the right to defend their marijuana fields with an AK-47 or whatever that meme says on it, you know, like, they're just like, you need to be able to do whatever as long as you're not violating this thing we call the NAP, which is their over, oversimplification of, of morality. Um, and and uh, that's what's important to them. And that's not what's, you know, that's a lot more important than the, than the, than the physical part of it. And yeah, most people I know nowadays are, are really against a lot of the stuff that libertarians are okay with. So I think liberty, a lot of them just need to grow up. A lot of them just haven't grown up yet. Yeah, I think one thing they don't realize and get is and you get a lot of pushback when you say it is, is that being socially liberal 
and being as long as you're not hurting another individual, you know, that kind of non-aggression principle thing um, creates a lot of degeneracy and degeneracy. And there also a lot of them have insane open border positions. They're just growing the state. So they can be they can be as fiscally conservative as they want, but their own ideology is actually expanding the state, growing the um, growing the welfare state, growing entitlements, and they don't see it because the all they're concentrating on is the fact that the state is the devil. The state's the devil. Anarchy or limited government or some kind of uh, minarchism is Jesus, and you know as long as it, as long as we can f- fight the devil, which is the state, they just blame everything on the state, not realizing that without the state, you'd still have the same problems in a culture um, that is degenerate. I mean, I, I just don't don't know any other way to describe it. And and saying that you could break off into covenant communities and you know you do your thing over there and I do my thing over here. Well that's just that's just what states are right now. States are right now we, you know we do one thing here, you you do something over there, but then conflict starts and that's when you have war. That's when you have genuine conflict. That's when you have to now put somebody in charge who decides the exception. And I just don't think that they get that when they're thinking about what, the, like you said, an oversimplification of morality, which is the non-aggression principle. Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of grew up politically listening to people like Stefan Molyneux and other, you know, the ANCAP types, and they have these cute little logical arguments for everything, and, and it's, um, you know, irrefutable. The state, like you said, the state is the devil. The state is the source of all the problems. We You share memes making fun of uh, statists and how you need the state for everything and private roads. We, and I'm well aware of all of the uh, logical fallacies and assumptions that go into all that kind of thing. And it sucks to be stuck in that mindset for some years. I, I hope more people grow out of it. They, they are also totally unaware of the um, the borders the borders issue. They 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 say borders are just arbitrary lines um, drawn in the sand by governments, and they aren't really aware of the 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 real reality. What actually happens when you put millions of people from a third world country into a first world country, and then when they don't assimilate, they frame it in the same way that the liberal the liberal liberals do. You know. And they'll say things like, oh, well, this group of people have, has chosen to not assimilate. What can we do about that? Let's pay some liberal think tanks millions of dollars to figure out what to do about this. Well, they're, they're simply not going to assimilate in any large degree. You can't move millions of people from a third world country into a first world country. They're not going to assimilate. You're just going to turn the country into the country they came from, which is very high in crime. And so that's yet another reason why it's a good idea to have large parcels of land that that you control and you that you know that kind of thing isn't going to come to your front doorstep or right next to you well they would say if we had anarcho capitalism you can have your large parcel of land and then everything is private property so that anybody anyone who's coming from another culture would just be trespassing by using the road that they think that they're privately going to own and yada 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 down this insane spiral of Oughts and what ifs and you know, I mean, basically sheer lunacy. Yeah, I, I like Hans Hermann Hoppe's article argument for, oh well, you know, the public property is is really belongs to net taxpayers and it's just been stolen from them. So you know, it's just really being held in trust. But it's like, yeah, but still, a libertarian making. I don't even know that a libertarian can logically make an argument for closed borders because any way of stopping them you're using you have to use aggression to stop them which is against their principles and if you know it's just if Juan is just walking and you know you stop him well you know you've you violated his quote-unquote natural rights whatever those are yeah I mean I don't know what I, what I can add to it aside from to, just to say that the the NAP is a childish concept. It's it's poorly thought out. You know, all the, the private road stuff that you mentioned too. Um, it would be 
so incredibly complex, you know, and they have all the hypothetical answers for you. Oh, we'll do the DAOs, the DAOs, the distributed autonomous organizations, and everything will be run by crypto and you'll drive your car on the road and sensors will tell which car, which roads you're driven on and subtract 25 cents credit for every private road. And it's just incredibly complex systems that are, it's much easier to just have the government control all that stuff, you know? All right. Well, I mean, I can, <clears throat> being a former ANCAP, I can be, I can tear into my former self all day. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask about was going back to the structure of what you're doing. So say, um, hypothetically, you have this private, private membership organization, and you have the LLC under it. And you have, you have, uh, basically what you're doing, you're buying a parcel of land, and then you're selling shares of it, to which somebody would be well i mean first obviously you'd um you'd vet them to find out if you want them to be a part of your community and then if you decided they're buying into it and basically having some kind of shares that would allow them a certain amount and then they build their own house on it and if they build their own own house on it do they build the do they own the house how does that work um yeah, they own the house. So it's, yeah, basically they own a, a share of membership interest in the LLC. And so the LLC operating agreement will say that based on your percentage, you have a, a certain parcel of land and there will be a map and some GPS coordinates. Uh, and we'll say, well, this is uh, the parcel that is yours. And it will be officially allocated to them by the, by the LLC. And so then anything they build on it, according to the operating agreement, is basically considered to be theirs. And if they were to be forced out, um, because say there's some huge problem, maybe they start committing lots of crimes or something and the community decides to um, to vote them out, basically do a forced expul expulsion from an LLC, which is which is allowed um, as long as there's good reason for it. Uh, one of the things they have to do is, uh, you know, compensate them fair market value for their share of the LLC. Just like if you get kicked out of being a business, if you're a business owner and you share the business with other people, you have co-owners, there might be a clause in your operating agreement where three of the owners can kick out one of the owners uh, but then it also says they have to compensate them fairly for their share in the business. Um, and so in that case, they would have to compensate them for, you know, the fair value of the house in addition to whatever the fair value of the share of the LLC is. And if they do it incorrectly, if the LLC board is corrupt and gives them $5 and says, you know, screw off, um, it's, you know, it's fairly easy to get because um, the LLC operating agreements legally LLCs have to follow them. Um, so a judge would say you did not compensate them fairly. Now I'm I'm going to decide what fair market value is. You know the judge is, and you have to pay them this amount. You know, and that's basically how that works. Why an LLC? When some people would say, well, it's really not legitimate. It's not in the common law. It's more an admiralty kind of thing. Where why not a trust? Why not a um, why not a classic kind of trust? Why wouldn't that work as well? Uh, I'm not an expert on trusts, and I should do more research on them. But as far as I understand, trusts are more expensive to start, more expensive to operate, more complicated, not as conducive to the constant buying and selling of small shares in it, uh, which not that we do constant buying and selling of shares, but in the LLC, if you start out and there's 40 parcels that can be allocated to owners, and you know there's going to be quite a bit of buying and selling just in that one LLC in the first couple of years. Because also some people buy in and then change their mind a couple months later. Uh, some people have a big share and want to sell parts of it. And um, LLCs are very cheap. They're very versatile. You can do a lot with them. Trusts are governed by a whole set of laws. Um, so I speak on this not as a legal expert, not as an expert on trusts. Um, I am going to do more research into trust, but I believe I'm still going to find that the LLC is the, uh, the better option. And somebody also suggested a general partnership would be better for this. The problem with the general partnership is there's no liability protection. Um, one of the great things about LLC is, is the, um, the owners uh, of the LLC, their personal assets are not um, on the table if someone were to take legal action against, uh, against the LLC, which it would suck if that happened. But also, if you personally own land, somebody can take legal action against you personally and, and get all your land as a judgment if you can't pay. So there's always that uh, risk there. It's just how can you mitigate it? 
And that is important when you think about litigation, when you live in a litigious world like we do right now, where somebody could decide that they're going to challenge existing law and you may get a sympathetic judge who allows a, allows a lawsuit to try to sue to allow them to go in there, even though it's a private membership uh, and even though it's an LLC then everyone who is associated and everyone who's bought in their, like you said, their private assets are protected. And then you only have to worry about the assets that the LLC has, uh, has acquired. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the great things about, um, I'm glad that we're talking about legal action because everyone in the conservative movement, uh, everyone to the right of, I don't know, <laughs> to the right of the, the, the weakest, uh, uh, supposedly fake conservative politician, anyone who's even mildly conservative has a fear of being dragged through the lawfare, being dragged through the coals, having to pay thousands of dollars in lawyer fees for nothing. Uh, something that should should have been obviously dismissed, like, for example, you know, Kyle Rittenhouse, but there's many, 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 many examples of people being abused by the legal system. And so uh, one of the nice things about having sort of like a centralized organization like the PMA, um, we you can all the uh, group land by properties can be associated in a way that they all contribute towards a legal fund. Um, in fact, one of the guys at the OGC, the old glory club conference was telling me about how his, uh, his fraternity in, in, in college had a massive legal fund, which is one of the great perks of joining. If you were to be unfairly prosecuted or sued for something, this fund would cover your, your legal costs. So one of the things we want to do in the future, when we're when we're when we plan it appropriately and are ready for it is we want to establish a legal fund where if one of these LLCs are targeted by I don't know the ADL or somebody or if there's even just some ridiculous legal case against them, uh, you have enough money to retain a lawyer right away. It's just there. That's it. Um, and you know, Orania, the community in South Africa, um, that's a you know very similar framework to what we're doing. They they don't I don't think they have a PMA, but they have a basically what's an LLC. And to buy into Rania, you're going to buy a share in the LLC, and they, they give you a piece of land or a house or whatever. Very, very similar framework. They, they have been sued multiple times, um, and they didn't lose, which is good, right? But they're big enough that they can absorb those kinds of legal costs. They, maybe they had to do a fundraiser or something, but it wasn't as much of an issue as if you have a, one small group land by community with 10 owners, and you get sued. All of a sudden, everybody has to cough up $5,000 afford, to afford some fancy lawyer. Um, and that would be a lot easier if you have a whole bunch of group land by communities under the same umbrella organization. Uh, and then they all paid into this sort of legal insurance funds, you know. So it's one of our future ideas. Is that what the goal is to get uh, brother, brother communities and basically try to create like an archipelago? Yeah, uh, that's what yeah, that's what my goal is. And I know there's going to be splinter groups, there's going to be copycat groups. And I say that with affection, not der derision. I, I think we should have copycat groups and um, uh, people that basically just take our our idea and do it themselves with a different like brand name or whatever. Um, that's certainly going to happen. Uh, but unless they can do something really big with lots of people and lots of properties, um, they're not going to have the strength and numbers that, you know, kind of like we're the first people doing it. So we better do it pretty well and we better expand. Uh, and hopefully other people do the same thing. Um, but if they don't have some massive movement underneath their feet at the beginning, then it's easier to tar it will be easier to target them than it will be to target us. So that's why people will be incentivized if they want to do group land buy and they have similar political and social beliefs. A lot of those people are going to come to us and be like, okay, we want to be a part of your organization because you have all these, all these great benefits. You know? What's the biggest obstacle to, uh, when you decided you were going to start this, what was your biggest obstacle? Um, the, the biggest obstacle, well, the thing that was the most work was just, um, getting all the documents and all the, doing all the legal research, research, writing the operating agreement, writing the articles of association for the PMA and the membership agreement and setting up all the web stuff and the forms that, that's all of the like writing, uh, paperwork type computer work site type stuff. It's just many, many hours of just drudging, you know, sitting away, uh, typing away in front of the computer. Um, that was the biggest obstacle. Everything else, yeah, you can get a group of people together, you can organize the people, you can send out emails and do telegram groups, get everyone all excited about something. Um, anyone can do that, that's easy. You know, it's just being motivational. But actually, uh, turning out the documents needed and the framework needed to make it work, that's, that's the obstacle. That's why it hasn't happened already. 
do you have it set up so that like anybody who was interested, who you approved of, they would have like a turnkey kind of system, all the documents set up and everything they can just uh, run with it. It wouldn't be, you know, you, 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 you did all the stumbling, you, you figured out all the mistakes and everything. And now someone can come in and they can uh, jump right in. Almost. Uh, that's what, in, in terms of by a jump right in, you mean like starting a, a group land by project like this. Um, that's what we want to do now we <clears throat> we i don't want to like start doing something without being 100 percent ready so so basically where we are in this process is uh we have we have a group land by property there's people living on it developing their their property there's there's families here we have we've had a couple events so far people lots of visitors have come we've had tons of people come and visit us people from the people from the pma of course um and that's where we are in our operating agreement it works you know everything works but we're right now realizing, okay, there's a lot of things we didn't think of. There's potential failure cases we didn't think of. We've had a lot of time. We've had since like October to really analyze things um, and also figure out the exact framework we want to use going forward. So we're in the process of updating the bylaws, uh, the, the operating agreement for our LLC. So then we can use that template for all future LLCs. It was like the beta stage and the operating agreement is like a piece of software. So we ran the beta stage. We tried to figure out if there's any bugs and now we're, you know, going to try to make a more final version. Same thing with the PMA. Uh, we're going to try to format the organization in a way uh, that allows for this kind of like certification system. And what we probably are going to do, this is not final, we're still discussing it. We're probably going to do something where if somebody wants to do group, group land buy in, say, Tennessee or Colorado or somewhere, um, we are going to require that if they, if they want to be sort of approved by our organization, which is called Return to the Land, um, they would one of one of the people that are going to be on their board of managers for the LLC that owns the property has to come to us. Uh, we have to meet them personally because we want to make sure they're not the kind of um, uh, Jeff Berwick type scammer that will lose millions of dollars of investor money, you know. Uh, and basically, we will educate them and take them to, take them to some properties and walk around the property and and explain how the parcelation works and how to plan uh, something like this out and and make sure they're the kind of person that can pull it off. And then we'll have a list of requirements for the LLC. We'll have the document templates ready for them that they can use. And we'll say, as long as you're using this operating agreement, as long as you have at least one person on your board that has been certified by us, then now you are a return to the land um, community. Now we can list you on your, on your website. Anyone in the PMA can, can apply to join. Now, there are additional requirements because the PMA has a list of, set of requirements to join. But now you're in the PMA. Maybe you wanted to buy into one of these... Uh, land owning LLCs, some of them may have additional requirements. One of them might be Christian only or a, only a certain sect of Christianity. One of them might be, for example, one guy was saying maybe he wants a community of only Irish people, right? So that might be a thing. Uh, so that's something to consider. Um, but that's basically what the process might look like, but maybe not exactly like that. That's just what we're brainstorming so far. We mainly want to prevent people from losing money. That's the main thing. We don't want anyone to start up a copycat community take our operating agreement, we, you know, stupidly call them return to land community, and then somebody just steals everyone's money or manages the project poorly, and it just dissolves. That would be really bad on our part to not have vetted them appropriately and educated them and like what's actually needed. A lot of young guys tend to think too much in terms of ideology and not much in terms of practicality. So they have all these great ideas of how they want to do a group land buy and all these ideas that they want everyone to follow and this and that. But they don't really know that most of it's just boring paperwork and knowing how to do the taxes correctly and taking the me the meeting, t taking the minutes when you have a board meeting and, and stuff like that. That's the important stuff. What would you say the end goal is? Is it to just have these communities and uh, be able to live fairly, you know, I mean, obviously you're not going to be able to live perfectly the way you're still being a part of an LLC there, there is still, you're still going to have to deal with the state and deal with a state that is, um, you know, at, right now completely hostile to your core beliefs. Beliefs. Is there some kind of end goal with this, or is this just to survive and get through what? I mean, I think anyone who is paying attention knows is going to be. Um, we got some rough years ahead of us. Um. We don't have any like huge overarching goals in terms of like we don't think we can decide where we fit into the uh, 
the the arch of civilizational collapse. Um, our 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 main goal is simply to do what we are trying to do, which is to uh, you know um, allow people to organize the purchase of large properties where they can turn into neighborhoods uh, and their families can live there. Um, being surrounded by families who have similar values where they don't have to worry about, you know, they can start homeschool co-ops. They don't have to worry about, um, people's other people's kids influencing their kids in weird ways. And, and, and basically, yeah, living around like-minded people, we just want to facilitate that. We want to make it easy. Anyone who does want that can do it. And that would just make existence a whole lot easier for a lot of families out there. And even a lot of single people who are looking to start families, it's going to make life a whole lot easier for them to live in a place where that's just what everyone is like. Everyone around you is just, it's just like that. You know, I remember at the, at the old Glory Club conference, everyone, everyone you talk to is just very similar, has very similar beliefs. And it was uh, so nice. It was very refreshing for a lot of people because most of the people in their everyday life is not like that. The kind of people you have to walk on eggshells around, you can't never say what you truly believe. So uh, that's what we want to facilitate. And if it turns into a huge movement, that would be great. Uh, but anything beyond that in terms of how we fit into the massive scheme of, of things, um, I, don't, I don't know if we would ever be able to predict that. You know, we don't have any, any goals larger than what we're currently doing. So basically, would it be safe to say, is this a, um, a good way to try to describe it, even though imperfectly, probably, you're, you're looking to create culture and cultivate your own culture you're not looking to change you're you're not thinking this is going to change the nature of the state but it could change the nature of the culture that you and your loved ones and people of like minds are subjected to yeah i mean the state is really big the country is really big even every single you know state in the united states is really 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 big um, just surrounding yourself with like-minded people makes a huge difference. It's almost like the outside world doesn't matter as much anymore. If you, first of all, you live in an area that's very conservative. Second of all, now you have a bunch of families living around you that are very similar. Uh, it, it almost makes all those problems go away. Almost. All those problems are still out there. But it's kind of like now it becomes problems in another country. Now it's like, why worry about the problems that are happening halfway across the country? Those people in California are stupid. I have my beautiful neighborhood right here. Uh, it's kind of like making a bubble, you know, not to pretend that everything's okay, but at least to make everything in your immediate surrounding okay, so you're not constantly um, having to deal with, um, you know, modern problems and not having, you know, modern solutions. <laughs> well, you know what a lot of people will say, especially some of our former um, fellow travelers, that um, you're just looking to create an echo chamber, and that's not good for anyone. How are you going to grow? I mean, how are you going to grow unless you have... You know, uh, unless your kids are getting uh, taught, you know, gay, gay, homosexual, you know, homosexual anal sex in, in kindergarten. I mean, what are you doing? Why, why are you why are you trying to deprive them of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, well, the echo chamber thing, I think they would they would say that's bad, not for your sake, but for the sake of other people. Like it's it's somehow our responsibility to educate and red pill all the other people. Um and this is why I brought up that verse in the Bible in the book of Isaiah uh, when I was talking of the Old Glory Club was because it's a very clear example of this time when there was a city that was in civilizational collapse and it was obviously going to fall and the people were very degenerate. And uh, God said to this man, go into the city and speak gibberish to them, right? Tell them things that don't mean anything, you know, confuse their ears because they can't be saved. It's kind of pointless. Uh, and in, I paraphrased it, you know, at the risk of going to hell for paraphrasing the Bible, you know, I, it says, okay, God basically told that man to don't not bother red pilling the normies. Now that said, I think there's a lot of great value in trying to red pill the normies because you actually do get through to some of them, but it's not everybody's responsibility to do that. People who are raising families, people who just want to live their lives, like it's not the responsibility of every single person to try to uh, educate every single other person. So if 95% of people live in an echo chamber, that's perfectly fine. And it's probably a lot healthier for, for their society and their culture and their people. Um, if a few people are out there on the internet or out there giving speeches, uh, you know, more or less attempting to red pill the normies, that's great. But we don't need everybody doing that. And it's definitely not everybody's responsibility to do that. And we certainly don't need our kids to be reading uh, cartoon novels on how to perform sexual acts in the kindergarten. Uh, just for the sake of trying to red pill some people that are never going to listen to us. 
Yeah, what I hear when people talk about echo chambers, I hear we have a right to have access to you. You know, I, I forget who said it. I think it was Jared Taylor who says um, that minorities, BIPOCs, people, you know, the people who make this culture so vibrant, they yes. really feel like they have a right to have access to white people and what white people have built. And that's what, that's the kind of person who's going to say echo chamber to you. Yeah, well, fortunately, um, uh, nobody has a right to access private property except for the, pro the property owner. So ironically, the solution to all these problems, the solution that we came up with is the ANCAP solution of uh, relying on private property rights to have control over an area. Um, so it's 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 kind of it's kind of funny. It really all comes back to anarcho capitalism. Right. And the NAP, that's what's really solving. <laughs> that's what we're really using to solve this problem right now. But truly using freedom of association and not caring why if black people don't want to be around white people, I don't have a problem with that. If Mexicans don't want to be around white pe black people, I don't have a problem with that. If white people don't want to be around anyone else, I don't have a problem with that. The problem is with a lot of those ANCAPs and a lot of those libertarians, they'll say, oh, well, you know, under the right of freedom of association, you do have the right to be in your little ethno state if you want. But that doesn't mean we're not going to judge you, which means that if I had the power of the state, I'd crush you. Yeah, yeah. And, and they've they've all most of them has still not um, thrown off their sort of like uh, racial or ethnic brainwashing, because if you bring up a lot of them, if you bring up examples of like, I like to bring up examples of like in New York City, you have entire neighborhoods where only Hasidic Jews live there, right? And that's because they prefer to live among other Hasidic Jews, it's more convenient for them. And they all follow the same religion and do the same weird rituals. So of course, it makes sense that all your neighbors are like that. And so there's also neighborhoods where it's entirely black people. And then you have Chinatown, where it's all Chinese people and Chinese businesses and everything. And so it's like, obviously, those Chinese people prefer to all live together among other Chinese people. It's just more convenient and, and easy for them. Uh, and you can kind of make a libertarian's brain explode by bringing up those examples and being like, well, see, they're allowed to do that. Perfectly fine if a, uh, if a white or European person wants to do that. So why would you use, you know, yeah, they're using their coded language to tell you they would use the power of the state to crush you if you did that but they would not want to crush the Chinatown or the Hasidic Jewish neighborhood in New York City. And you can kind of make their brain explode by pointing out those inconsistencies. It's not just certain groups that you tolerate doing that. You should tolerate everybody doing that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, if people want to get more information about what you're doing, where can you point them to? Now we have a beautiful website called returntotheland.org. Uh, it does have some information about basic structure of what we're doing. We are going to put out a lot more information, but for now, everything you need to know is on there, including links to join the private membership association. And someone asked recently, do I have to be like interested in coming out to the Ozarks and buying land there uh, in order to join the PMA? It's like, no, you don't. Uh, we're probably going to rename the PMA soon to make it more clear that it's a nationwide thing. Anybody uh, can join the PMA. And once you're in the PMA, you can come to events like our week-long Eclipse camp out, which had almost 80 people there, uh, and uh, Fourth of July camp out, which we're actually having right now. Not a huge attendance because of the, the heat, but we're having a, a five-day camp out at the end of October this year. Uh, anyone in the PMA is welcome to come, so we're probably going to get at least 80 to 100 people out here, uh, including lots of families, so it's a great way, you know, you, you don't have to worry as much when your kids are playing um, with kids from the family, the families that attend our events, because almost none of them attend public school or have crazy ideas in their heads. So you're in the PMA, you can attend our events, and you can also uh, uh, apply to join one of the group land buys, in other words, buy in. Uh, and we also have a separate, like, we have a public placing telegram chat, and then we have a PMA chat um, with a lot of different activities. Sometimes people who are looking for people to work on their house or a website job or whatever, we're trying to do the whole parallel economy thing. So the PMA is basically like a big social club, uh, and it's only going to get bigger. Um, so if you go to returntoland.org, you can um, see that information, apply to join, and do an interview, and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, I like the uh, 80 to 100 people. Dunbar's number is uh, very important to me. When when I have people brag to me that they got 1,000 or 2,000 people to their events, I'm like, what kind of organization can you 1,000 or 2,000 people do? 
compared to 80 or like when we had at OGC, I think we had just under 150. A whole lot more yeah. organizing, a whole lot more organizing can be done with those numbers. And I think a lot of, honestly, a lot of times when people say they get 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 to their event, it's just because it makes them feel good. And, and for, it's, for no, it's for overwhelming. no other reason. Yeah, it's overwhelming to be an event that large. Um, I mean, certainly cool, but also overwhelming. I think, you know, I think in the future, rather than having massive gargantuan events when our PMA grows even larger, I think we'll probably, when we have group land buys around the country, some of them will host their own events. So you don't have to travel. People travel really far to come to our Eclipse camp out. Um, so they won't have to, if we have group land buys around the country, we could have five different camp outs um, in different regions, you know, and attract, you know, people. So it's it's a great way, you know, to meet everybody and and, uh, you know, networking and all that kind of stuff, see what the project's all about. Yeah, that's the goal. The goal, you know, OGC, our, I think we've said our national event is going to stay under 150. But as we grow, there'll be other events and, you know, regions will have their own events and uh, keep them under 150. It just doesn't. It, it, yeah, it can be fun to be at an event with a lot of people. Uh, but really, when it comes down to it, all your it, it's just a um, like a rally. You're not really. Oh uh, yeah. How much can you really get accomplished? Uh, yeah, it's like yeah. a it's like a Trump rally at that point, and it's a lot less intimate. It's like you could meet a new person every minute and still not meet everybody there. Uh, yeah. yeah, I remember they were saying at the OGC conference they were recommending that people when they start their local chapters they start to have like little mini conferences where you could like rent a, a hall or a lodge or whatever for a couple of days. You know, everyone dress up in suits and uh, you know network and and give some talks and and re be really cool if some of the local chapters start doing that in their areas. Um, and I was kind of joking to my friends here that w w our camp was kind of like the OGC event, like minus all the suits and ties and everyone's camping instead of staying in a nice hotel. So. Uh, it's, you know, in the end, really similar types of events, but, you know. Yeah, our um, our group down here in Alabama that was started down in Auburn, um, they, even if they're meeting in a house, jacket jacket is required. Well, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, it, it's good. It's, Anytime you look at pictures from the olden days, people are working in the fields wearing like a, a three-piece suit, it looks like sometimes, you know. <laughs> Bit of an exaggeration. I, really, I, yeah. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much. I'll make sure to link to everything.